us. Um, you may know him as an author, a writer, um, editor in chief of Current Affairs, and just a uh, an all around uh, neolib, uh, you know, educator uh, <laughs> on Twitter. Right. So thank you so much for joining us, Nathan. I appreciate it. Oh, it's it. so nice to be here. <laughs> well, and you guys, as usual, feel free to add comments and I'll kind of scan what I can while we go through things. Um, so first, let's talk about your most recent book because you have it pinned on your Twitter page. Oh, yes, I um, do, don't I? So, and, and I think my audience would definitely enjoy it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Can you, do you just want to kind of give the title, explain what it is and um, just kind of give a, a synopsis? So the book is called Why You Should Be a Socialist. And it, essentially, I originally called the book Socialism for people who are extremely skeptical of it. Many of us have embraced in recent years, especially since Bernie Sanders' run in 2016, that word socialism. I didn't used to use it, but I, I do now. And I think and, and a lot of people, the polls show that the word socialism is uh, changing and its popularity. People are coming around and sort of coming to identify with that term. So this book is my attempt to kind of explain what socialism means to a lot of the people who use it, uh, why that term has become so popular recently, what the kind of underlying political dynamics going on, particularly in the United States, are that have led to this resurgent left, especially among millennials. And I wanted to respond to traditional conservative caricatures and counter arguments and i did want to give because i know that you know even though we have a kind of vibrant young left in this country it's still true that there are plenty of people who are apolitical or who have just heard this term but doesn't don't really uh, understand what it means, um, and, and are curious, and I wanted to give, I wanted to write for people who are not uh, necessarily socialists already uh, to invite them to come and join the left. Do you think it, it, the labels are important? Because I know, like, most mm. Bernie Sanders supporters will say, we're democratic socialists. Yeah. Do you think that that distinction <laughs> is is necessary put it well that way. i think a lot about this especially in in, in writing the book because i used to back in 2015 i wrote a thing that said you know bernie sanders is not a socialist right because um uh, he, oh, he, you know, th there's this argument, there's this long ongoing argument about whether he's a socialist or a social democrat, and what is social democracy, and what is democratic socialism, and it, what's the difference between socialism and democratic socialism, and you get into all these terminological disputes that seem to distract from the point, right? And, and as you're having all these arguments, what do we really mean by these abstract terms? Sometimes you feel like you're almost wasting your time. Is it, would it be better to just, to just skip the term entirely. I, I came around to the use of the term uh, socialism, especially after 2016, because it seemed to capture very well what was common in a lot of people who had the same political aspirations and were kind of the part of the same political tendency. They all would have affirmed some of the same propositions. They would have uh, affirmed that the existence of a, a society that is structured by economic classes with an owning class and a working class is unjust and has to be gotten rid of. And they share the dream of having a society that doesn't share those features, that doesn't have economic classes. And so that's, a, and the word socialism captures that common set of beliefs and aspirations that people have. And so to the extent that you, know, you need a term to communicate what people all share, what their beliefs are, I think it is actually reasonably useful. And I, I think that Bernie Sanders and AOC and you know myself and lots of other people who use this term, we do all believe a lot of the same things. And that word helps to capture what it is that sets us apart. It's interesting because I've gone back and you know looked at um, old articles and stuff from, you know, 2008 and stuff. 
they actually called Obama a socialist. <laughs> so looking back, like, does that show you that the word has evolved or that people are becoming kind of more educated in a way or? It, well, it's hard to say, you know, I just got, I'm just writing a review actually of this awful book called the United States of Socialism, uh, who's behind it, why it's evil and how to stop it by Dinesh D'Souza. Um, and his position is that Obama is a socialist, that the entire Democratic Party are socialists, whether they like it or not. Nancy Pelosi is a socialist. You know, they're all because they're all for big government and socialism just means big government. And so I and I think that that stereotype still exists in many parts, especially on the on the right. I think the right doesn't really see a distinction between Nancy Pelosi and Bernie Sanders, right? Uh, or between Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders. I think to many conservatives, like they don't understand what the fight is about within the Democratic Party because they consider all of us a bunch of loony leftists. And they <laughs> and so when you say, no, 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 they, those are centrists. We're the we're the leftists. Um, they don't know, they don't know what you're talking about because they think every because they've been saying for so long, as you as you cited, that just the Democratic Party as a whole is an extremist party party bent on turning America into Venezuela. Um, unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> that's so transparently stupid that it's actually <laughs> made it easier for those of us who identify with the word socialism to reclaim that term because they spent so long uh, slinging it at Barack Obama and sort of draining it of its force. Absolutely. Now, what is your response to when, you know, people say, um, they're commies they're not socialists they're commies what is you know what's the best way to you know kind of explain that to people or do well, you just not even waste the, the your best time? way the best way to explain it is to give that person a copy of the book why you should be a socialist good point <laughs> Good point. Because <laughs> it's got all the answers uh, uh, to that. I mean, I guess but the thing that, that I that I say that we should do right is go. Well, okay, call me social. You know, let's let's talk about what we're actually talking about. Let's talk about what are the common aspirations and views that people like Bernie Sanders and AOC and the millions of people who have been inspired by their campaigns, all the people in the DSA, what are the real things that they believe and want? What inspires them? What do they think ought to be different about society? And I think the word, words like commie are designed to associate the left, obviously, with Stalinist tyranny, with North Korea, right? They, well, that's what they want you to think. But then if you start describing, and I describe in the book, and I think um, Bernie Sanders and AOC do a, do a great job too of, of like communicating what it is that we really want. When you describe the society that, that we want, that's not what it looks like at all. And in fact, you know, the word commie is, is used to try and suggest that we don't value civil liberties, to conjure gulags, but it's socialists who have been the foremost critics of the American prison system. It's socialists who have been saying we lock too many people up, there are too many uh, things criminalized in this country, the power of the state is too militarized, the police are too militarized. Well, if we were trying to expand the authoritarian state, that's not the argument that we would have been making, we would have just been saying we need to seize the militarized state for, for ourselves. But we're actually very strong critics of the overreach of state power. And we talk a lot about the importance of individual freedom. Absolutely. You you loosely touched on Pelosi and we were going to go into her anyway, because I was reading, I was rereading your article on her uh -huh. and she's just such a mess. So I definitely wanted to address her in some regard. Um, so can you do you remember writing that article and also do you want to like I'm just looking it up right now to, to remember what I said. <laughs> Bring so many. I know I turned <laughs> them out at, at such a pace now that I that I'm like people people say, Oh, I remember this article. Uh you're like I I I I wrote about that. I, I did I did what? <laughs> I said what? And they're always like that, trying to go like you're oh you're a terrible opinion on this. And I was like, I didn't even <laughs> remember myself having an opinion on that. No, I, 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 I found it uh, recently, yeah. 
I, I just I just found the article. Yeah, yeah, we could talk about it. Yeah. So what's your what's your take? Also, what what Pelosi has been doing lately with coronavirus? Also, yeah. She's being challenged. Um, I'm having Shahid back on my show. Oh yeah, he's on. Yeah, yeah. I actually, a few months ago, I had him and the two other people running against Pelosi do a, a three person debate on my show. So it was really interesting. So now I'm going to be having Shahid back by himself um, and cool. hopefully get cool. some more voters because uh, <laughs> yeah, let's get her ass out. So. What what is your take on on just the what the way she's running things with with the pandemic? Well, I before before the uh, we get to the pandemic, I th I think it's important to say why because I wrote that article before the pandemic and and Shahid's yeah. uh, campaign you know started up a long time ago. So these these the problems that he identifies and that I identify with uh, her leadership have been there for a long time. And to me, it could be summarized by the fact that when Nancy Pelosi has been asked about things like Medicare for all and the Green New Deal, the sort of signature policy items on the agenda of the left, she's mocked them. She said the Green New Deal was like the Green New Dream or whatever, right? And I, I think people need to think about what that really means to have someone who is the leader of the supposedly progressive opposition party, who is not just saying that she's opposed to the plan for really bold climate action, but dismissing it as if the people putting it forward are not serious, as if their concerns are not real, as if they're crazy. And she does the same thing on Medicare for All. And I think that that's, I just think that's unconscionable because the, 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 the Green New Deal is being put forward as basically the only adequate approach to the scale of the problem that climate change represents. And she should know that because she accepts climate science. Uh, there's a great article in Jacobin called The Democrats Are Climate Deniers. And it's about yeah. how a lot of the mainstream Democratic Party say they accept climate science, but they don't act in the ways that you would need to act if you, if you thought that the findings of climate scientists were real. And so to be led by someone like that is really dangerous because we need a powerful opposition that is focusing people in on all of the issues that matter the most. And on, on thing after thing that happens, a lot of us were very frustrated by the impeachment drama, not because we don't think Donald Trump should be removed from office, because I, I certainly do. Um, but because it was about the, the the underlying subject was so far removed from the actual human toll of Trump's rule, and I think that that runs through the uh, the coronavirus response, right? Where yes, they have been they have criticized the Trump administration, but they have also been complicit in and supported one of the great. Uh, inexcusable injustices of this crisis, which is giving a totally inadequate amount of support to ordinary people and giving a, an inordinate amount of support to giant corporations. And Democrats under Pelosi's leadership have not pushed for the kind of radical level of um, sustaining the population in the face of something that is just undercutting everyone's life. And also, it makes clear, this crisis has made clear precisely why it was so wrong to argue that single-payer uh, health care was, um, you know, would throw people off their insurance, which is what the Democrats have been doing this whole election cycle. Well, now we know that employer-sponsored health insurance throws tens of millions of people off their health insurance in a crisis. And so that's the system under which people lose insurance. Under a single-payer system, no one ever has to lose their health insurance ever. And so lies have been spread by, by, by Democrats, the people we need on our side, the people we need building a social democratic platform. And that's why I'm so excited about Shahid's run, because you know he, he really gets this. I, I really don't think she'll debate him, but my no, no, would that never. be amazing? She won't. 
Absolutely <laughs> that, not. That would be so phenomenal, though. It'd be fun. I, I digress, but I thought of something today that's terrifying. Like, if, okay, so if Biden picks a VP and then the VP pulls the 25th Amendment, then Pelosi would become the VP. Is that how it works? I, I have no idea how it works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah, it is, isn't like... it? If they, uh, yeah. Oh well, my God. You know, actually, actually, I gotta say, might be better because the VP doesn't really have much power, but the Speaker of the House has a tremendous amount of power. And that's actually been one of the big problems is that she's been in a position where she's been leading the congressional Democrats. So I think actually, I don't think she'd want to take that job because, um, you know, it is, VP is not what a, is second <laughs> Hopefully, like if Bernie's too old, that's 78, she's 80, so then she needs to not. Yeah. <laughs> but that's a really good point about VP. Um, so I'll, I'll try to calm myself with that. <laughs> um, what else do I have? Um, you wrote an article, um, Donald Trump will run to the left. Mm. And you were right. <laughs> you were correct. Yeah. You were correct. I'll say it that way. Um, <laughs> what is that? Um, what is your, you know, what kind of inspired you to write that? And yeah. then also, you know, we've seen him do that multiple oh, yeah, times. Yeah, yeah. Well, it happened in 2016, right? On certain things. Um, you know, you know you, Donald Trump sounded like uh, Bernie Sanders in many ways, where he's talking, uh, you know, about just how corrupt uh, the government is. Hillary Clinton being in the pocket of Wall Street, uh, voting for the Iraq War, uh, all of these things. You know, you know, NAFTA. He sounds like a, you know, he sounds like a union organizer on NAFTA, right? Um, and so that's an example of, of running kind of to the left. Uh, of course, he doesn't govern to the left because his administration is basically captured by, you know, free market ideologues. But um, mm -hmm. but he runs to the left uh, because he, he Donald Trump is a very savvy politician and he knows what works and he knows this is why he didn't want to get run against Bernie Sanders. And he's actually on tape saying he didn't want Hillary to pick Bernie as VP because he knew that Bernie's message would resonate with people. He says that. And, and, and now because Bernie's not the nominee because Joe Biden's the nominee and Joe Biden has the same vulnerabilities that Hillary Clinton had, it means that Donald Trump can come out and, you know, I, I've laid out all of the ways in which he's, I mean, he's going to, he is going to talk about the 1994 crime bill. He does it all the time, right? He, 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 he literally, he ran an ad in the Super Bowl promoting his record on criminal justice reform, talking about letting um, black women out of prison, right? Like that's, he's already running to the left. He's already setting himself up to say, Joe Biden helped expand the prison system. I, Donald Trump, believe in justice. Joe Biden was in the pocket of big banks. I'm an independently wealthy person who's beholden to nobody. Don, Joe Biden gave all these favors to Wall Street, right? That's that's kind of what he's gonna do and has, I mean, it's not a, a prophecy, it's literally what he's, what he's doing. And I think Democrats, many of them still don't quite get that he does this, that he will do this, and that it's quite effective. Absolutely, we have, seven months till the general and trump's already coming out with ads that just destroy joe oh i and know and joe came out with that disgusting racist oh, ad the dumb thing. yeah yeah what you, was your yeah. reaction the first time you, you watched it did you see the uh the trump ad with the uh biden biden doing the rambling and obama watching it uh, yes i mean the thing is <laughs> kind of funny right like it was like you could see how people are gonna laugh and people are gonna laugh mm -hmm. because it's true because biden is i mean he said that that's a direct clip they're not you know he gave the weird rambling story about the leg hair and it was it was odd and <laughs> off-putting and he does things like that all the time right and and he's gonna just create more and more fodder 
for Trump. But yeah, when I saw that, I was, when I saw that China thing, um, it was really concerning because, uh, you know, obviously, like criticizing Donald Trump for being too soft on China is a little weird, considering that my position is that Donald Trump is being unnecessarily aggressive and antagonistic towards China and to try and goad him into being into greater hostility at a time when we need global co cooperation to solve a global problem to goad him it reminds me of the way that you saw a lot of people who were saying when trump met uh with he, when he went to north korea when he had the you know when he was when he was extending diplomacy to north korea right people saying well oh you're coddling dictators well i would be very careful about saying like trump needs a more aggressive stance towards the, a country like North Korea. Diplomacy is good. We should want diplomacy. and But Democrats have this position, which is kind of reflexively anti-Trump sometimes, which is like, if Trump does something, it must be bad. And if, you, if, that's, your, if that's your position, then you can end up sounding pretty right wing when Trump does like a really unexpected thing, like going like, look at him sidling up to the Chinese and you're like, who are you? What are you saying? What, what this is not progressive. Mm -hmm. Well, Joe, a couple of weeks ago, he was doing an interview and he called it the Wuhan disease. And I was like, wait, didn't Trump call it that? Yeah. And weren't people freaking out? So I don't know. I guess he didn't learn because I was like, holy shit. Like he, he said it. I couldn't believe wow. it. Yeah. That's why they don't want him on TV. Like even I something I noticed is even in Biden's own commercials, it doesn't even have his voice at the end saying this message is, mm. you know, approved by Joe Biden. Like it doesn't have him at yeah. all. The less we and I'm like, the better. Like they can't even get him to say that like Well, I I, <laughs> like, I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, you know, when back during that like critical week when everything was getting worse and Biden had like disappeared completely. Mm -hmm. um, and if people say, where's Joe Biden? Why has he made any public statements? And he was like, I'm building my TV studio. You know, I, I, I wrote one of, I wrote an article saying, you know, we need to see Joe Biden in a moment of national leadership. You can't just disappear. And uh, then they actually started putting him out on interviews and on television. And I felt really stupid because I was like, oh, I should not have been asking for them to show Joe Biden on television. Oh, uh, let's, let's, uh, let's reverse that, actually. I, I take it back completely. Don't put him on TV. Yeah, seriously. And, and I'm like, okay, wait. I do my show, I've done over 300 shows in my spare bedroom in front of a dresser. So I don't wanna hear his lamp isn't working well. Like <laughs> Bernie had a lamp on the floor and it was from like 1971. Yeah. yeah. And it was, oh my gosh, what a mess. And you know, you get it a lot too. When you, um, you know, state facts, about Biden or, or anyone, you know, who's a Democrat, people go at you. Yeah. They cannot, anyone with a D next to their name, they will be absolved of anything to those neolibs. So, and yeah. I saw they were going at you like two days ago because you said something about Elizabeth Warren, which was a million percent valid. Yeah, And that's one of the reasons I got turned on to your writing because you always stood up for, you know, you always stood up for people who wanted to call Liz Warren out. Yeah. Um, and you were one of the few, unfortunately. Well, so, yeah, I think, yes, uh, it, it's true. There's a lot of, uh, and we can talk maybe about, uh, you, you know, the idea of voting for Biden in the, in the general election and what do you do with all the stuff that we, we hate and, and that Democrats are excusing, but it's inexcusable. But yeah, at least one thing, I mean, I try and have a consistent standard that I apply. I think that's very, very important. I think you need to apply the, the same uh, kind of judgment uh, to every politician. So if a politician uh, on the, the right says something and it's bad, then it's equally bad if someone says it, as you say, with a D next to their name. Uh, it doesn't make a difference. And so I, I think 
the primary is very frustrating in a way because Elizabeth Warren came out sounding pretty good at the beginning. And I, I wrote some positive stuff uh, about her and was trying to give her a chance. And I think a lot of us were. And I think uh, a lot of people didn't want to be antagonistic towards someone who seemed like, well, the kind of the second best person in the Senate. Um, someone who is at least as close to being on our side as it gets in U.S. politics without actually being Bernie Sanders. Um, but Elizabeth Warren started saying and doing things over the course of the primary that suggested that she wasn't really as on our side as she wanted us to think. Um, she didn't seem to really be with Bernie on a lot of stuff. She did this whole, her Medicare, she was like very odd on Medicare for all, right? Like she would never go into details about what it was. She's like, of course I support Medicare for all, you know, but I'm not going to raise anybody's taxes. Well, that's weird because like the whole point of Medicare for all is like, yeah, it raises some taxes, but you save way more in your, in your premiums. Um, but she wasn't saying that. And then she released this weird plan um, that everyone criticized. And she started saying things. She said bad things on foreign policy. She said, like, I'm OK with billionaires. She was out directly, like, do you think billionaires should exist? And she's like, yeah, I, th I think they're fine. And that's like a real dividing line between her and the left, because we kind of see the existence of billionaires as like a feudal system where it gives people far too much power. And so there were the real dividing points. And of course, then it got worse where eventually, after the first, especially after the first couple of states, because progressives were still divided between Sanders and Warren, um, even though she was way behind, it was really eating into Sanders' vote and making it much more likely that Biden was going to be the nominee. And so I started writing articles that were saying, look, we have to consolidate behind Bernie Sanders now because, look, Elizabeth Warren's not going to catch him up. And if we don't unify, we are going to lose. And she stayed in the race. And not only did she stay in the race, but she also like started attacking Bernie Sanders, which you think, no, 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 you should be endorsing Bernie Sanders and coming out for him. And instead she did the thing where she told that a woman can't be president. And then she did, uh, and then she started criticizing him as someone who got nothing done in the Senate and kind of echoing the other Democrats' criticisms of him. And it was like, wait, do you want there to be a progressive nominee or not? Like, and ultimately when she dropped out, she didn't endorse him, which really says she wasn't on our side at all because kind of, you know, the, the same way that sitting out a the election of Joe Biden and Donald Trump is considered a vote for Trump, sitting out the Biden-Bernie race was kind of an endorsement of, of Biden because it meant that Biden was probably going to be the nominee um, because Warren wasn't pushing her people towards Bernie. And it was a, a huge, huge problem. And, and a lot of people didn't want to write about it because there's this sense we don't want to inflame disputes on the left. You don't want to, uh, you know, you don't want this ugly fight. But it, I mean, I think it needed to be said. Yeah, and and she continuously attacked all of all of us supporters. Oh, yes, that's um, and, and, yeah, and uh, I you did the one article that said um, you shouldn't vote for Warren in Iowa mm -hmm. uh, because Joe Biden will become the nominee. And I left Pennsylvania to uh, volunteer for five weeks in, in Iowa for Bernie. Nice. And I said that over and yeah. over and I read your article and I'm like, oh my God, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's ex that I just, I saw the people, like I was at a caucus site, mm -hmm. you know, volunteering and I saw it with my own eyes, you know, people just splitting up. Um, right. And you know, unfortunately, we were right. Yeah, and in, in you know, in Iowa, ultimately Biden kind of flopped. But what what did end up happening is that uh, Pete Buttigieg did well enough to where, even though Bernie got the most votes, like the state delegate equivalent numbers were kind of fudged for a while, and they allowed Pete Buttigieg to spin it as a win. And then Bernie didn't have as much momentum that is he would have had going into New Hampshire as he would have had if he'd had a really clean um, and undeniable win in Iowa rather than it being close. And that wouldn't have happened 
if a, you know a, a fraction of the Warren supporters had moved over to Sanders in the recognition that we have to unite behind a progressive nominee and voting for the second place candidate is voting for someone who is going to effectively spoil the election. You know, I, I have always criticized, I criticized people voting third party in swing states in 2016. And I mean, I don't like Hillary Clinton. I wrote a ton of negative stuff about Hillary Clinton, but I felt like, you know, Donald Trump was so horrifying that you gotta, you know, vote for a Democrat if you live in a state where it matters. That's, that's my position. And my, it's the same position I had in this primary, which is like, we cannot let Joe Biden win. I was screaming every vote in that article I had, every, uh, every time a progressive votes for Elizabeth Warren, Joe Biden's smile gets a little bit wider. And I had a, I had a close up picture of his mouth just going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And now he's the nominee. Exactly. And I think we also saw that when um, it came time, when all of a sudden within 48 hours, here goes Pete, Cory mm -hmm. Booker, um, you know, like everyone, Amy, like they all just started dropping and dropping. And I kept saying, oh my God, like this is so bad for us because they were dividing. Uh, um, and unfortunately, yeah. the person who couldn't get votes anywhere except South Carolina ended up being essentially the nominee because everyone else dropped out. Yeah. Um, so it's obviously not surprising Obama had a hand in this. Oh, yeah, he's making calls. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so what was, did you kind of expect that? Well, I think I, I didn't expect, and I don't think anyone really expected that sudden, the suddenness with which it happened. Though as soon as Pete Buttigieg dropped out, I did tweet I bet they're on the phone to Klobuchar now, and you'll see Klobuchar drop within a day. And then she did, because it started to be obvious what was happening, which was they had realized what was, you know, what should have been obvious for a long time, which was that all of their centrist candidates were weak. Pete Buttigieg was never going to break through with voters of color anywhere. So he couldn't be the nominee because the Democratic Party just has so many voters of color. So it couldn't be Pete Buttigieg. Amy Klobuchar was not popular enough outside her home state for it to be her at all. Um, so the, and Cory Booker um, and people like Julian Castro, I think it dropped even earlier, they had um, already, they would, their poll numbers were just so low to where it was never gonna be them. Um, Kamala Harris, who seemed like she would be a pretty formidable contender, had dropped out way earlier before the voting even started. Uh, and so it had to be Joe Biden by just process of elimination. So they thought, well, if we don't try and push Biden through now, Bernie's going to be the nominee. And there were plenty of articles that they were, they were quite open. A lot of Democrats, yeah. they, you, know, they, you know, big, big donors and top party officials going, we have to stop Bernie. We need to do anything we can to stop Bernie. And even though they all knew that Joe Biden was a bad candidate um, and, a, and a risk, they had no alternative because of that process of elimination and because he just won South Carolina. It had to be Biden. Um, so they jumped in behind Biden. Do you think that they're aware that he may not make it, like, cognitively? Um, is He's made a few statements that... The, whoever the VP I pick is, they're gonna have to be ready to immediately step up. <laughs> like immediate, and I mean that. Like I mean immediately. Like, gonna... <laughs> like he said in June. That, yes. That's what he said, literally yeah. in June. And I'm just kind of like wondering if they're kind of toying with the 25th Amendment, because he almost sounds like he expects he's not going to like yeah. last. <laughs> I know. I've heard. I've heard him say things uh, like that too, and yeah, you wonder. Uh, I think there is a lot. I know there's a lot of talk that says, "Oh, well, you know, they're going to replace him." People are. I know that there's a lot of sort of people in the Democratic Party who are like, Ooh, "I'm not too confident. What if we bought here?" But again, they did it because they had no alternative, right? They had no alternative but to do this. And I think the problem is now there isn't an obvious way out. So there's a, 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 you know, him, him literally stepping down and putting someone else in his place 
is just such an anti-democratic thing to do after such a long primary. I mean, you know, there is a mechanism. I mean, he'd have to voluntarily step down, but like, you know, if Obama calls him and goes, Joe, you have to step aside for the good of the party, we'll make up a story, um, you know, it, it could happen. Uh, you could do that, or you can, you know, plow through the, the general election. And I don't quite know how that's going to work, because you already see Trump's ads are very good. He's going to be great in the debates. I mean, I'm just going to cringe watching the, the debates, because I don't think... Although, you know, Joe Biden's weird, because, like, one thing I have noticed is, you know, you got all these terrible clips of him, but... If you watch the whole interviews, he's like he's he's coherent for most of them. It's most, <laughs> like 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 it's like eighty percent of the time, maybe eighty five. He's like he's like kind of he sounds like a normal person, but then every interview has one of these just little moments that becomes the clip, and it's the only clip that anybody sees. Like Joe Biden's final debate with Bernie Sanders, he did an okay, he did a fine job actually. It, it was it was not bad, and um, I'm like I'm hoping that they're gonna pump him full of whatever they were pumping him full of for that <laughs> debate for the Trump debate because he might do exactly. Okay, but it just feels like such a risk. It does. It absolutely does. Oh my god! I <sighs> yeah. I mean, Trump agreed to debate Bernie in 2016, and then he dropped he out. out. And Backed out, and I'm like, oh my god, he he is so terrified of Bernie, but Biden, he's just he's gonna be like Hunter, like he's just gonna bring all kinds of crap up. Because you don't back out of a debate that you think you're gonna win, right? Sure. If he thought he was gonna do really really well against Bernie, he would obviously go through with that debate. But what he realized, and what Trump knows, because Trump is is pretty savvy. Like he's not book smart. He's an idiot, but he's like smart, like a con man is smart, and so he's not educated. But he 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 knows politics, and he knows, and he's smart enough to realize that Bernie Sanders has something. And he's watched. He watches Fox News all day, so he's seen when Bernie goes on Fox News, and. He's seen that Bernie does a really good job on Fox News and that Bernie knows how to pitch his politics to an audience that doesn't agree with him and that actually just saying the word socialism just literally sets him up to go like, well, my socialism means I believe this, that, and the other thing. Do you not believe in those things, Donald? Because uh, no. I, you know, I think they're fundamental human rights. And uh, I, I think Trump realizes what would happen. Yeah, absolutely. And Bernie, since day one, has been like, I'm going to blow up your tweets on the Senate floor. And I mean, mm -hmm. he has called him a racist, xenophobe, and, you know, sexist yeah. since literally day one. No one else has. So I think in a weird way, he kind of respects Bernie because of that. Just because yes, he's Yes, so I think you're right. Yes. Which is weird, but like... It's, no, it's so true. It, it's so true. You can sense it. He doesn't hate Bernie. He kind of likes Bernie. You watch his rallies. If you watch all the Trump rallies, he always makes fun of all the Democrats. And then when he gets to Bernie, he goes, eh, crazy Bernie, crazy Bernie, you know. And he'll say something like, you know, Bernie Sanders, he has big rallies. I think my rallies are bigger. But they're not, he doesn't have the right. kind of like derision and mockery that he has towards all of the others. And that's why... I thought, and you you probably thought too, that like we just need to let Bernie Sanders at this guy because like this is our weapon. This is this is oh the God, guy yeah. who can make the case. <sighs> yeah. I don't think there's a single person who would not vote for Bernie if they saw him on the stage with Trump. It would be amazing. Yeah, it would be Absolutely so good. Amazing. And it's just so frustrating to be in this situation now, especially now that we're in a situation that calls for like the politics of an FDR and we've got our guy and he's sitting waiting there going like, let me add it. And, and, and now we're running Joe Biden. Joe Biden, who told people to go out and vote in this pandemic. Oh, God. oh I know. Oh, God. That and was, more that, and more poll workers are, are turning up sick. That was a gross thing because the Biden campaign forged ahead with that. And then they had the audacity to, after the fact, go, oh, we didn't think people should have voted. And 
the Democrats spinning it as just, oh, the Republicans wanted everyone to vote and the evil Republicans wanted people to get sick. And it's like, actually, the Biden campaign wanted that primary to go forward because they, they knew that with the polls standing where they were, he could, knock, he could finally knock out Bernie Sanders. And if the primary had been, if the Wisconsin primary had been delayed, Bernie probably would not have dropped out when he dropped out. Um, because it would have meant that there were months until the next primary, and maybe the polls could shift in those months. But uh, so, but in the Biden campaign, knew that they had to get him out of the race, and they didn't care how many people died. <laughs> like it's crazy uh, in, in order to make that happen. Well, the one interesting interview I saw um, was they asked Biden, "Do you think uh, Trump has blood on his hands for having people going out and vote during this time?" And Biden's like. I think that's a little harsh, and it's like, yeah, no shit, because yeah, you did it too. Yeah, you don't want to, you don't want to commit to that because it'll be wielded against you. Uh, gross. Um, so just uh, like, let's say, who do you think Biden will pick as a VP? You know, I don't know. I mean, you know, people know the usual list. Uh, I. I I, I I think probably the smartest choice I think probably is Kamala Harris, but um, I don't know who he'll pick because I don't count on the campaign to make the smartest choice. <laughs> Look, yeah. think of the worst, <laughs> most incompetent possible choice, and it might be the one that he makes. I mean, I think Kamala makes the most sense too. I can't stand her, but I can see. You like I get it. She projects really competence, like though. That's that's yeah. why she's well, good. Well, that is true. That yeah. is true. But I I really want to see K Hive just completely melt down. If it's not her, her supporters will just go bananas <laughs> online, and it'll be really nice to see that <laughs> after how mean they were to us. But for like over a year, I have sworn that. Hillary was going to be the VP and she was going to, um, they'd pull the 25th. She'd step up. I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> the thought of her letting another woman be VP or president before her. I just, I can't, I, I yeah. just can't think about it. I, it would blow you know, my it's mind. It's not inconceivable that it would be Hillary is the sad thing. <laughs> well, she hasn't endorsed Biden yet. I think she's like holding out. You better she give me this position. Mm -mm. That's crazy. So she she wants something. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, it's terrifying. <laughs> every time you think, like, what would be the problem. worst worst playbook they could run? They Absolutely. Always fulfill your expectations. I, it's literally like people who have run three times joining up. <laughs> like that's. So Oh, oh yeah, let's get Biden, the guy whose presidential campaign, his first presidential campaign, collapsed because of plagiarism and lies. You know, let's let's get that guy, and and who is now like of questionable fitness. Right. Let's run and him. I, <laughs> I also before I um, I know you have to go, but one thing I definitely want to touch on before we end is your staunch advocacy for Tara Reid. You have been like just such an ally to her and and to those of us who want her story to be heard. Um, so you've done a lot of commentary yeah. on it. What kind of stands out to you most about Tara Reid and, and how we should progress? Well, yeah. And I mean, you know, these, these uh, kind of allegations are difficult because, you know, the situation, but for the first thing people say is, oh, there are no witnesses. So how are we ever going to know that the truth of the thing, but the entire point of the reason that the leave women and, and me too emerged was that a lot of these things happen in private and you're never going to know. So you need to trust, at least at first you can verify and you can examine the allegations, but at least at first, you need to take women's stories seriously. And the most glaring thing here is the hypocrisy of the fact that the standards that are applied to Donald Trump and to Brett Kavanaugh aren't applied when it's a Democratic politician. The standards change. Um, we don't know everything about 
Tara Reid, but we've heard her tell her story. We know that there are two people who say that she told them about it at the time in 1993. There are some other confirming uh, details, um, like you know, the New York Times talked to a couple interns who say they remember the thing that she says happened, which is that her supervisor position was removed. Um, you know, so based on what we know right now, at this moment, it seems that like it's something that has to be taken seriously, and yet you see a lot of attempts to. Um, you see a lot of really unfair criticisms that we know we would know would be unfair if they were applied to um, uh, 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 if they had been applied to Christine Blasey Ford, um, for example, um, that people wouldn't accept. And so, like the, you know, the real demand here is for a consistent standard that says, like, if if we're going to say that it matters when women come forward. Um, then it has to matter in this case too, and we can't brush it under the rug because it's politically inconvenient. And I think that's the the danger of only having Joe left. That's that's not good. That's why Bernie should have stayed in. But I get that he was just worried people kept getting sick, and that's what it seems like it went down to. But. Um, as far as Tara, she said that there is documentation um, that that is sealed, and I don't know that we'll ever see it, but mm -hmm. I feel like the way Elizabeth Warren went at Mike um, for his, mm -hmm. I feel like she should be going yeah. at Biden for his. Yeah, right, because if there's nothing to hide, then you know you shouldn't you shouldn't be afraid to have the records examined. Um, if there is something to hide, then, you know, then <laughs> it's obviously why you're keeping it sealed. So like, you know, if there's nothing to hide and it turns out that there was never a complaint filed and actually this wasn't true, um, then that would presumably, um, come out or they'd have some proof or they'd have, you know, what I want is them to offer an alternate explanation for why her, her intern supervision duties were taken away. You know, if it's not because of the reason that she says, then why is it? Um, and Joe Biden hasn't been asked about this once. Um, Bernie Sanders has been asked, you know, uh, yeah. women who ran against Joe Biden even have been asked and Joe Biden hasn't been asked. And so, you know, they've not if they say that they're you know trying to verify this and they're just putting the kind of scrutiny on it that and that you need before making a, a serious accusation but it's quite clear to me that they're not asking the kinds of questions that you would ask if you really did take seriously the philosophy that this stuff is serious and has to be taken seriously absolutely well, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate it. I love speaking with you. Um, there's a lot of comments um, if you want to read afterwards. But, yeah. Um, Hello to everyone. Uh, <laughs> definitely follow Nathan on Twitter. Why the hell did you delete all your tweets? Oh, I just like Twitter. So, oh. I've gotten rid of my tweets now. I'm, I mean, I'll probably, I'll probably tweet more eventually, but I just- like, I was like doing my research for tonight uh, and I'm like, what happened? Well, I can send you, I downloaded them before I before I deleted them. So you can- Oh, that's uh, smart. You, that's you know, smart. You, you, can have, you can look into the archives when, whenever you like. <laughs> I just want to like, oh, it's such a mess. I was just combing through and I was like, I get into so many arguments. And someone told me, they said, you're one of my favorite accounts. And I remember people used to say you're one of my favorite writers. And I was like, I need to get back to being more, slightly oh. more productive because I'm becoming too much of a, a Twitter account and not enough of a magazine writer. And I need to refocus. I need to use this opportunity to refocus on my magazine writing. So people, if anyone follows me on Twitter, they might not see much for a while. What they should do is subscribe to the magazine, Current Affairs, and, uh, and uh, read our magazine at currentaffairs.org. Awesome. Thank you so much again. Um, you guys, I have ridiculous shows coming up. Um, so I'll post a link with all of them tomorrow night. I have New York candidate, Laura Ashcraft coming back. Um, she's awesome. I have writer Eric Blanc coming. Oh, he's great too. Yeah. Yeah. As, and I have Shahid coming up. I have, I have so many. I, I'm booked That's for the next list. 
So, you got all the heavy what's hitters. What's that? That's quite a guest list. You've got all the heavy hitters. You got oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do all right. Honor to be included <laughs> among them. Oh, thank you so much for joining us, Nathan. Anytime. I am so glad I got to speak with you. I, uh, awesome. I hope we do this again. I hope we do this again. This was really Absolutely. Fun. Thank you so much. Thanks for watching, guys. Okay. Bye now. Bye bye.